Good day, this is Trip. I hope you will subscribe to my channel. I hope you will like my videos and share them with others. This will be something a bit different today. It might be a bit too deep for all of us, especially myself. We're going to read from one of Aristotle's greatest works. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher. He lived from 384 to 322 BC in ancient Greece. And I'll defer to my notes a little bit on this one. He's considered the father of Western philosophy. And his writings cover so many subjects from the sciences, physics, the theater, history, economics, and government. He tried to pull together all the philosophies of those who had preceded him. Western civilization inherits its intellectual energy and framework plus methods of intellectual and scientific inquiry from Aristotle. And of course, Aristotle was also a student of Plato, one of the great philosophers. So Aristotle's teachings influenced thought during the Middle Ages, as well as the, the Christian theology. He is revered among, uh, among the medieval and Muslim scholars as the first teacher and among medieval Christians as simply the philosopher. So today I'm going to take some readings from the Nicomachean Ethics. I hope I pronounced that right. And that's the name that's normally given to Aristotle's best known work on ethics. Ethics, ethics is something that is certainly sorely lacking in our government and industry today and among each of us perhaps and this work discusses the moral virtues of getting the balance of one's behavior in social and political situations achieving some kind of balance in that and if i stumble some here just remember it is my desire to to go a bit further than i'm used to going and to learn something useful and challenging to my mind. And I hope that even if it's a little too deep that you'll find it perhaps arresting and relaxful. Relaxing. <laughs> and if you fall asleep during this, then that's quite all right too. Okay. As usual, I'll leave my glasses. And I promise you we won't do too much of this. I just want to see how it comes out. As we some, as we some people say that some people who do just acts and not are not necessarily just, that is those who do acts ordained by the laws, either unwittingly or owing to ignorance or for some other reason, and not for the sake of the acts themselves, but to be sure, they do what they should, and all the things that the good man ought. So it is, it seems, that in order to be good, one must be in a certain state when one does the several acts. That is, one must do them as a result of choice, and for the sake of the acts themselves. Now virtue makes the choice right, but the question of the things which should naturally be done to carry out our choice belongs not to virtue, but to another faculty. We must devote our attention to these matters and give a clearer statement about them. There is a faculty which is called cleverness. And this is such as to be able to do the things that tend towards the mark we have set before ourselves and to hit it. Now, if the mark be noble, the cleverness is laudable. But if the mark be bad, the cleverness is mere smartness. Hence, we call even men of practical wisdom clever or smart. Practical wisdom is not the faculty, but it does not exist without this faculty. And this eye of the soul acquires its formed state not without the aid of virtue, as has been said and is plain, for the syllogisms, and viewers don't worry too much about that word, it means something like 
a conclusion or an inference. Let's continue. The syllogisms which deal with acts to be done are things which involve a starting point. Whatever it may be, let it be for the sake of argument, be what we please. And this is not evident except to the good man. For wickedness perverts us and causes us to be deceived about the starting points of action. Therefore it is ev evident that it is impossible to be practically wise without being good. We must therefore consider virtue also once more, for virtue too is similarly related as practical wisdom is to cleverness. Not the same, but like it. So is natural virtue to virtue in the strict sense. For all men think that each type of character belongs to its possessions in some sense by nature. And from the very moment of birth, we are just or fitted for self-control or brave or have the other moral qualities. But yet we seek something else as that which is good in the strict sense. We seek for the presence of such qualities in another way. For both children and brutes have the natural dispositions to these qualities, but without reason these are evidently hurtful. Only we seem to see this much, that while one may be led astray by them as a strong body which moves without sight may stumble badly because of his lack of sight. Still, if a man once acquires reason, that makes a difference in action. And his state, while still like what it was, will then be virtue in the strict sense. Therefore, as in the part of us which forms opinions, there are two types, cleverness and practical wisdom. So, too, in the moral part, there are two types, natural virtue and virtue in the strict sense. And of these, the latter involves practical wisdom. This is why some say that all the virtues are forms of practical wisdom, and why Socrates, who is another famous Greek philosopher, why Socrates, in one respect, was on the right track, while in another he went astray in thinking that all the virtues were forms of practical wisdom. He was wrong. But in saying they implied practical wisdom, Socrates was right. This is confirmed by the fact that even now all men, when they define virtue, after naming the state of character, and its objects add that state which is in accordance with the right rule. Now the right rule is that which is in accordance with practical wisdom. All men then seem somehow to divine with this kind of state as is, is virtue, that which is in its accordance with practical wisdom. But we must go a little further, for it is not merely the state in accordance with the right rule, but the state that implies the presence of the right rule. That is virtue. And practical wisdom is a right rule about such matters. Socrates then thought the virtues were rules or rational principles. For he thought that they were all of them forms of scientific knowledge, while we think they involve a rational principle. It is clear then, from what has been said, that it is not possible to be good in the strict sense without practical wisdom, nor practically wise without moral virtue. But in this way, we may also refute the dialectical argument, whereby it might be contended that the virtues exist in separation from each other. The same man, it might be said, 
is not best equipped by nature for all the virtues so that he will have already acquired one when he was not yet when he has not yet acquired another this is possible in respect of the natural virtues but not in respect to those not in respect of those in respect of which a man is called without qualification good for with the presence of the one quality practical wisdom will be given all the virtues and it is plain that even if it were of no practical value we should have needed it because it is the virtue of the part of us in question plain too that the choice will not be right without practical wisdom any more than without practical virtue or without virtue at all for the one determines the end and the other makes us do the things that lead to the end. And I'm nearly through, so please, a minute is too longer. But, but it is again, but again it is not supreme over philosophic wisdom, over the superior part of us any more than the art of medicine is over help. And it does not use it, but provides for its coming into being. It issues orders, then for its sake, but not to it. Further, it maintains its supremacy. To maintain its supremacy would be like saying that the art of politics rules the gods because it issues orders about all the affairs of the state. Don't worry, that's it. I know this was quite tedious, but I was trying to reach a little bit further, and this is probably too tedious. I don't think I'll try to do this again from one of the great philosophers like Aristotle. I probably failed him. I hope I have not failed you. I hope you got a little something from it, and if it did nothing more than make you think a little bit and help, or help you to relax or even to get to sleep, then I'll be happy with that. And this is Trip. Until next time, goodbye. Peace out.